He is a 69-year-old man who has ischemic cardiomyopathy and peripheral vascular disease that's very stable. Uh, he does not have any significant PAD in terms of claudication, but does have some proven disease below the knee. He presented to me uh, complaining of many years, if not decades, of heaviness and tiredness, fatigue in his legs. He's had cramping and restless legs along with a lot of itching. Uh, he has swelling in his legs as well. We did a duplex ultrasound, a venous duplex ultrasound of his legs uh, several months ago, confirming pathologic bilateral great and small saphenous vein reflux. He has already undergone uh, radiofrequency ablation with the venclose device of bilateral great uh, saphenous veins and now returns today uh, to take on his right small saphenous vein. Uh, on the ultrasound, the size, the diameter of his right small saphenous was 5.1 millimeters, and it displayed 2,742 2, milliseconds of reflux. He had no deep vein thromboses, and he did have a perforator and a tributary that had reflux that we are not planning on treating today, but, but discovered and will know about. He has SEEP4 disease and a VCSS score of 10. And we will begin by touring you through the ultrasound anatomy. Uh, one of the most important things we do after we prep a patient is we tour through the anatomy with the ultrasound for several reasons. One is to f identify the course of the vein to see if there are any anatomic variants. Uh, but also to see if there's any interval changes from our diagnostic ultrasound. And as you can see on the ultrasound, it's very straightforward. There's a small saphenous vein in the center of the screen. It's encompassed by fascia, uh, the superficial and deep fascia. Um, it has that kind of a classic uh, Cleopatra's eye appearance right there that Casey's showing you. And this is the small saphenous. We also want to look for the deep veins. So Casey, show us uh, how uh, the deep veins look first to make sure we don't have any deep vein thromboses. So I just do a quick compression of the vein to make sure that there's no obstruction. And you can see the popliteal vein that she's compressing midway through the ultrasound there in the middle of the field. It compresses nicely. So no indication of a, of a fresh interval thrombus. And so I'm gonna give a little bit of a wheel here. It's hard to see with the gel. And you wanna be careful when you're numbing the leg that you don't induce spasm right at the spot where you wanna enter. And you can see I'm just going pretty slow um, so that I don't go too deep and get into the vein itself. It'll, it's very, these veins are very uh, vasoreactive, and so they can, you can induce spasm quite readily. So then I have the introducer needle. Uh, there's an indicator showing the bevel up um, on this, and so we always want the bevel up to help uh, advance the wire in. I want to put my probe in the ultrasound and the image of the target of that small saphenous directly in the middle of the field because then I'll pick right in the middle of the probe and use a 45 degree angle for my approach in. And so I've got it numb, I'm gonna kind of stab through the skin. And as you see on the ultrasound, I'm kind of poking through on the front wall of the small saphenous. And I'm intentionally just showing this to you where I like to have the needle right in the middle of the, the circle, if you will. The globe. If you're off to the side, it can bounce off, but you can see I'm really well positioned here. And then I just make a quick little stab like that as I aspirate and to see if I am through. And I don't have return, so I think there's catching the front wall a little bit. And now I did. And that's a little, that's an instructive uh, point there. You can see the, on the ultrasound, it looks perfect but it actually was grabbing the front wall of the endothelium of the vein. I, have, I look to see if I have confirmation of venous return, and I do, and then bring in the wire. Go ahead and look at it. And I, this is a 
a tactile and a visual uh, way of knowing if I'm in the center of the vein. And you can see I'm advancing it. It feels very smooth. I have no resistance. And Casey is scanning up, following me as I go. We like to do that routinely to watch where the wire goes because often it may divert off the off path into a side branch. Uh, four by four. Okay, so then we take the introducer needle out. I like to make a small little incision for cosmesis so it can heal very, uh, very well. You don't have to. And then we thread the micro introducer sheath um, over the wire and into the vein. It's good practice to make sure you can aspirate and flush. You can, if it's a small vein and there's spasm on the vein, it may be very difficult to, to, to aspirate back, but you can see it's pretty easy to flush the catheter. And we know we're intraluminal. And she hands off the device to me and you can see the, the catheter is a six French catheter that has a natural curve. Um, which is very helpful as you negotiate through anatomy. You do, don't typically have to shape this at all. Um, and of course we have a 10 centimeter uh, heating element and coil and three divisions that mark off two and a half centimeters, which we'll get to about converting this to the distal tip function. There's a warning track here, I call it, with X's uh, at two and a half centimeters and another with lines to show that you're getting near the end when you're inside the body. So these are very important markers uh, to, to know. And then we have this, the, the back end markers that match to the length of the sheath um, so that when it exits here, you'll know where the proximal end of the coil is positioned in the vein. So we put the catheter into the vein. And again, we like to watch the, the transfer. I'm feeling, and I actually found some resistance pretty early on here. And I'm gonna, I just torqued the catheter because of the shape and it's just nicely got past that little resistance that might've been a valve or a side branch. And it just slipped in right past that. So it's important not to just ram this through uh, to kind of feel and have that tactile uh, response here so you know if there are any barriers to transmission. So Casey has positioned the ultrasound right at the mid popliteal space. We know that our termination is a probably a deep vein, the femoral vein where it's going down. Um, and so we're bringing this back and we want to demonstrate now on ultrasound that we know exactly where the sheath, where the, um, the device tip is. And this is a very nice demonstration on ultrasound where you'll see the echo density, the linear echo density. You can actually see portions of the coil. Um, there's the tip and then you see where it almost looks like two with that, that extra density there. We know that's the tip. One of the, I, the tips here is to move your, and jiggle the catheter gently and you can prove to yourself in the sonographer uh, that the tip is where you think it is. And we actually have. So this is in, in perfect position. Um, and we're gonna, I'd like to index, once I know it's in position, I like to look at the next marker here and I will anchor the catheter in my hand and pull the sheath back right to that marker. And then I know that's my start point for my pullbacks. The next stage is to administer the two mesins. Two mesin anesthesia is um, hanging in the bag on the IV pole. And this is a mixture of, for us, we use Ringer's lactate, uh, we use epinephrine, and we use lidocaine that is administered around the vein to anesthetize it and also protect it from surrounding structures. So here I come in, I'm gonna enter in where it's already numb on the skin, on that first wheel. I have it bevel up. I'm putting my ultrasound uh, our probe in the sagittal view, laying out the catheter and the vein. And you can see as I'm working, working through here with the pedal 
administering the tumescence, which shows up black on the ultrasound. The fluid, the, the water in it will be very, very echolucent, so it's dark. There's a fluid, and you can see me pushing down the vein um, and pushing it away from the skin. We want to keep a safety distance all the way through the treatment away from the skin of at least five millimeters. I'm sorry, at least a centimeter. That's the tip. And we are at the tip. And you can see that nice shadowing. You know the tip because of the, you see these three uh, shadows, acoustic shadows, and that's really telltale uh, to know that that's the, the, cat, the coil. Um, again, he, this imaging is very good, but other patients might have a lot of fibrosis and it's very easily to be fooled and you, it's really vital that you know exactly where your catheter tip is when you're administering the heat. So we want to move pretty quickly once we have the tumescence in just so it doesn't dissipate and it's very important to triple check your position at the top and where you're going to be initiating because you might have inadvertently pushed the catheter in, the patient moved, and you certainly, um, you know, you can't turn back. Once you hit the button, you're, you're heating. So I'm just going to jiggle a li little bit. I always confirm with my sonographer uh, so that we have um, two opinions on that. And if we disagree, we have to convince each other of where the tip is. So it's vital we see that marker. We're very confident. We're in perfect position. And now I'm going to take um, the handle and going to activate uh, the vent close. And so I push the button. And we see very quickly the heat uh, is heating up. Within five seconds, the target is 120 degrees Celsius. There's an algorithm to maintain that temperature, uh, varying the energy that is being delivered uh, to the coil. And there are 20-second cycles, and so we're going to treat twice at the uh, first location uh, for both the small saphenous, and we do the same usually uh, at the great, great saphenous as well. So that's our second 20 second uh, treatment cycle. And now we're gonna pull back and do a tandem treatment. And so I have my marker here. And so that's my start point. I'm gonna use the hub to help me. That's one, so that's two and a half centimeters, five centimeters, 7.5, and 10. So that's the length of the coil. And now this is tandem. And we're also right at the end. It happened to work out perfectly that this is where the end of the sheath uh, is a safety distance away from the beginning of the coil. So you're not heating the sheath. We also like to watch the ultrasound to show that we're seeing treatment effect. We see scintillating or uh, bubbling, if you will, or boiling of the blood uh, to know that we're delivering the heat energy. So several different ways of getting feedback that you're delivering um, the treatment. So I'm going to pull back again because we treated that and we did one, two, three, four. That's 10. So that's the same. And now it's very important as you get past this warning track that you don't treat without seeing your coil. So I like to anchor the catheter and then pull the sheath out of the body without moving the catheter, without moving the catheter position. So now I have the sheath out of the body and I see the, the other uh, warning landmarks and I have the double X. So I know that the end of the catheter is right here. It's very, very close. And so that's too far down to treat because we know we start getting approximating the sural nerve branches in this area and it's very close quarters to muscles and tendons, uh, even though we did transmission. So typically we like to terminate on a small saphenous, just cephalad to that bifurcation of the gastroc and away from that sural nerve that I was demonstrating to you earlier. So we're gonna switch the catheter and do one more because this is right uh, just above where we saw the sural nerve and we can verify here with the ultrasound. And so Karina is going to switch the catheter and just a simple put, uh, push of the screen. You can see it went from a 10 centimeter coil, uh, coil treatment length to two and a half centimeters. 
and we have an audible feedback where the tone changes to know that is doing that. Um, I like to hold my hand if I see the coil out of the skin, I put my hand there so that it will burn my hand if there's a malfunction or we didn't hit the button. I just use that as a safety precaution. Um, and then we activate it once we're certain about this, it will still deliver the 20 second uh, treatment. But you can hear the pitch uh, from the generator is at a higher level. Um, and we can also see that we're just having on ultrasound the two and a half centimeter treatment length right at the distal tip of the catheter. So the decision to be made now is if we're done or we want to do one more, I'm anchoring this again so I have a landmark so I know exactly how much I'm pulling back and I'm going to pull back one more two and a half centimeters right to there. Now, as you can see, the coil is outside the skin. It's outside the body. Again, if we were on the 10 and didn't switch, we would be burning a hole at the skin, um, not advised. And so we uh, also know that we switched it to two and a half and we're down a little lower here. And so this is where um, it's just above that area, the sural nerve, and we wanna stay a safety distance away and so I believe we will stop here, uh, for, again, to preserve uh, safety for that sural nerve. So I'm going to take this out and um, simply put pressure on the entrance site, and we're done. So the color is on color right is now. On. So if we had patency of the vein, we would see a little ribbon of flow. It's not unusual to see that, uh, whether you're treating a great or small saphenous vein. Uh, because we, when we take out the device, the tool, there's a little void where the catheter was. Um, and without a lot of pressure, you might see a little patency um, as it's as immediately afterwards. Uh, don't be surprised by that. Um, if you've given the treatment and the therapy, you're creating the intense inflammation and injury to the wall. And over time, that's going to fibrose and certainly will thrombose in the near term. It looks great.